So it's pretty good to avoid foods that spike your insulin really high, but it's really good to avoid accidental spikes in insulin. For example, drinking some kind of beverage that spikes your insulin that you didn't even know it would. I mean, talk about a hidden trap, right? So let's focus on the drinks that you can consume that will not spike insulin. Okay. But before I do that, let me just get right out in the open the things that you need to avoid. Beverages that have sugar, that's obviously going to spike your insulin. Beverages that contain high fructose corn syrup, obviously going to spike insulin. However, there's controversy because some people think that high fructose corn syrup is pure fructose and it's not. Okay, fructose, like the sugar that comes from fruit, believe it or not, doesn't spike insulin. But unless you're consuming a literal pure fructose, you're never going to have that situation because fruit even has fructose and glucose. And high fructose corn syrup is just separated glucose and fructose. So getting that off my chest, let's move into some fun stuff. Okay, first one, obvious, carbonated water. Okay. There is some weird stuff out there. I think I saw like a Reddit forum a while back that talked about how the carbon dioxide that's added into carbonated water to make it carbonated could spike your insulin. No, not the case. It's just water. If anything, there might even be a benefit. So that one's good to go. Okay. Now let's move into one that has some controversy too. That's coffee. Coffee is confusing again, because some of the data is a little bit conflicting. Okay. Now, because of the caffeine content of coffee, there's a good chance you're going to have an insulin spike that comes just from that. Okay. But don't go throwing away your coffee just yet. Just hear me out on this. Okay. When you have a massive spike of caffeine, it's going to do a couple things. It triggers the release of stored carbohydrates. So you have a little bit of stored carbohydrates that release, but you also have a spike in adrenaline. You also have a potential spike in cortisol. And these are your fight or flight responses. So what those do is those of course trigger the release of stored glucose. Okay. That can elevate glucose levels, can potentially elevate insulin levels, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're having like a net negative effect. Let's look at some research. The journal of traditional and complementary medicine did a meta analysis or they took a look at eight studies with 247 participants. Okay, and they found overall that coffee did lead to sort of over a weekly time frame a slight elevation in insulin. So at first it says, okay, I don't want to do this when I'm fasting because it might spike my insulin. And over the long term, maybe it's bad. Maybe coffee is triggering this insulin resistance. But when you look further at the data, you also see that this meta analysis included studies, it cited studies that demonstrate that consistent coffee consumption actually can lead to a potential 25% reduction in type two diabetes risk. Meaning that even if there is a short term little spike in insulin, the benefit that you get over the long term from the polyphenols and some of the antioxidant capabilities actually could have a powerful positive effect on insulin resistance. When you look at how coffee is metabolized, it's metabolized very fast. And whenever something is metabolized really fast like that, it can definitely trigger an insulin spike. So it's not a huge surprise that there was a subtle little bump. Okay. It's kind of like if you look at a protein shake, for example, like whey protein absorbs very fast in a shake form and that quick absorption triggers an insulin spike. Albeit in that case, it's alongside glucagon, but that's a story for another day. Long story short is the net positive effect of caffeine and coffee outweighs the potential little insulin blip. You're also driving up what's called AMPK with coffee. Okay. So caffeine is going to drive up AMPK, which allows your body to tap into its stored tissue better. So even again, if you have a little spike in insulin, that net result that you get by releasing and liberating fatty acids and glucose could actually have a much more powerful effect over the long term. So I say coffee is good to go. This next one is kind of interesting. This is beverages with sucralose. And this is a double sided answer here. Okay. So beverages with sucralose, you've got things like those ice drinks. Uh, you've got things like uh, diet Hansen's is sweetened with sucralose. They use it as an alternative because sucralose is arguably better than aspartame, at least in some people's eyes. Here's what's wild. Okay. In a fasted state, like totally fasted, it doesn't seem as though sucralose really spikes insulin. Okay. It doesn't seem to have that much of an effect. So although I don't necessarily care for the stuff and I have pokes, holes that I can poke in it, I'm not going to tell you that it's going to spike your insulin. However, there was a study that was published in the journal diabetes care. And this took a look at sucralose versus water after a glucose load. So after a bunch of carbohydrates, the sucralose group had a significantly higher spike in glucose and insulin than the water group, 
What's the deal there, right? So what's possibly happening here, and this is the hypothesis upon the research groups, is that it's possibly changing the gut bacteria that is changing how the carbohydrates are handled. Okay, there are some studies, although somewhat inconclusive, that artificial sweeteners like sucralose can alter the gut biome, potentially affecting glucose tolerance. But it looks like by this study, in the short term, maybe the sucralose is altering the gut biome and altering how the glucose is utilized from a meal. So what does that mean? It means that, as much as I don't like to say it, sucralose would probably be okay during a fast, but it doesn't seem to be the best thing to have along with a carbohydrate meal. So if you're say like, oh, I'm gonna have this piece of pizza, but I don't wanna overload on a bunch of uh, you know, insulin spikes and carbs, so instead of a diet, so or instead of a regular soda, I'm gonna have a diet soda, diet Hansen's, you're probably better off to just have water, or carbonated water, because it looks like it's gonna spike the insulin still pretty darn high. Which brings me to the next one, stevia. There's a lot of beverages sweetened with stevia. You've got things like Zevia. You've got beverages that are like the little squeeze packets, the little uh, things that have like, I don't know, liquid concentrates that have stevia in them. Those kinds of things, it's a big question mark. What's the deal with stevia? Well, there was a study that was published in the journal Appetite that took a look at stevia versus aspartame versus sucrose, okay? And they had them consume these things directly before lunch and dinner for three days. Believe it or not, the stevia actually ended up decreasing glucose and insulin after the meals. What is going on here? Now, I wear a continuous glucose monitor, so sometimes I do notice that when I have things like stevia or monk fruit, it drops my glucose, and that would typically imply that maybe I'm having a little insulin spike, right? Because insulin opens up the cell doorway. So if I spike insulin, then glucose might drop. But they're measuring insulin here too, and they saw that insulin dropped. So it looks like stevia may, this is you know, wishful thinking, crossing my fingers, may have sort of a glucose modulation effect, which could be kind of cool. So it doesn't seem to spike insulin. Although I've seen some situations with monk fruit, as much as I love this stuff, monk fruit might be more insulinogenic but it's still pretty negligible. Again, I've noticed again, wearing a continuous glucose monitor that when I consume monk fruit, I tend to have a pretty aggressive drop in my glucose, indicating that maybe insulin is spiking. There's lots of different stevia-based drinks and stevia-based kind of like concentrates, stuff like that. Uh, Thrive Market has quite a few of them. They're today's video sponsor. So no specific product in mind other than the fact that you might want to check out Thrive just for your grocery shopping in general and pantry staples. So if you're doing something kind of low carb and you want to find options and beverage options and things like that for low carb, check out Thrive Market. They're an online grocery store. You can filter by category. You can filter by like gluten-free. You can filter by sugar-free, filter by all the stuff. So you can take what I teach in my videos and practically apply it to your shopping online. It's pretty cool. And that link down below will allow you to save 25% off your first order, which could be awesome. Plus you get a free gift when you use that link down below. So again, head on over there. It's your one-stop shop. You can make it so you can filter by whatever category and they get everything delivered to your doorstep. Super easy peasy. So they are down below in the the description. Now the big one. This one deserves its own video, erythritol. Okay, erythritol, as far as what is put on a label, it's considered a sugar alcohol. So a lot of times it gets kind of roped into being a carbohydrate, which can kind of be confusing because during a fast or when you're not eating, like, yeah, you could argue that maybe it's going to be a food because it's going to be metabolized to a certain degree, but is it going to spike insulin? Well, there's a study that was published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition that compared glucose to erythritol, and the results were pretty interesting. They found that erythritol did not increase glucose or insulin, no change at all. But what was even more wild is it wasn't even fermented in the gut. Normally a sugar alcohol or you know, a fermentable demonstrable or anything like that would get broken down by the gut microbiome. Okay, and that would be some degree of metabolism which might instigate some kind of insulin response. They found that 90% of the erythritol that was consumed was absorbed and then excreted in the urine in its whole form. Only 10% was actually degraded. So only 10% was really metabolized. The rest was just absorbed and excreted, which means that you're potentially getting a sweet taste without any real detriment. Now, that being said, there's still question out there like how erythritol can affect the brain, can it cross the blood brain barrier? There's a lot of big question marks out there, but as far as insulin and overall like kind of calorie energy load, 
practically nothing and definitely good to go as far as insulin is concerned in terms of beverages that it's in. Green tea. This is a big one because there's a lot of people out there that still say that the catechins in green tea can potentially trigger an insulin spike. Okay, we'll talk about catechins in a second. Let's get caffeine off the table. Okay, if caffeine in coffee triggers a little insulin spike, then one would think the caffeine in tea might trigger an insulin spike. But the caffeine content of green tea is so low, you're definitely not having that issue there. But let's talk about catechins for a second. The main catechin in green tea is EGCG, which you've probably heard of before. EGCG does not spike insulin. In fact, EGCG has an inhibitory effect on the liver. It inhibits gluconeogenesis in the liver. Okay, so gluconeogenesis is where you are converting other substrates into glucose, like breaking down protein or breaking down glycerol backbones from fatty acids, things like that, breaking that down into glucose. It actually inhibits that and therefore drives up AMPK. When you drive up AMPK, you are definitely not spiking insulin because insulin would drop AMPK. So in the very sense of what the primary catechin of EGCG is doing, you are like the literal opposite of insulin. That being said, one could argue that the peaks and valleys of different catechins might actually trigger a small insulin spike, but when you have the outweighing effect of EGCG, I think it's safe to say that it's not going to spike your insulin. Plus, the satiety effects, the increase in potential cholecystokinin, like how it can actually keep you satiated, again, is going to keep you from overeating in the future, so I think the net effect in terms of insulin sensitivity is probably very, very positive. Okay, so just to recap here, carbonated water, good to go. Black coffee, absolutely good to go. Sucralose, good to go in a fasted state, but not along with food. Aspartame and saccharin, not gonna really touch on those because they're very ambiguous and it's hard to really get data on them. Okay, then we have stevia, going to be good to go. Might have a small insulin spike, but it seems negligible. Monk fruit does seem to have a little bit of an insulin spike, but still good to go, especially if you're doing like a low carb protocol. Okay, erythritol, although I'm not a fan of it when we're fasting because there's still question marks out there, it doesn't seem to spike insulin. So especially along with a meal, a drink that has erythritol in it seems to be really good. Green tea, definitely good to go, plus added benefits. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.